Hello, 3ABN family. I'm Jill Morricone. We welcome you to a brand new quarter of 3ABN Sabbath School panel. That's right. We're studying the book of Psalms this quarter. I'm excited. It's one of my favorite studies. Lesson number one is how to read the Psalms. Before I introduce your family here at the table today as we explore the Word of God, I want to tell you we're doing something brand new. We are offering our notes to you for help in your study of the Word of God or when you teach your own Sabbath school lesson in your church. So all you have to do is email us at ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. And we would love to send you every week our lessons for that coming week. Now with that out of the way, let me introduce our family to my left, Brian Day, singer in Israel. Delighted to have you here, brother. <laughs> Amen. Always a blessing to be on 3B and Sabbath School panel, I have Monday's lesson entitled, Meet the Psalmist. Yay, mm -hmm. in the middle, Pastor James Rafferty. Delighted you're here. Good to be here, Jill. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, A Song for Every Season. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Denzi. Delighted you're here. It's a blessing to be here. I was not here the last quarter. And this Wednesday portion is what I have. It's inspired prayers. Amen. Last but not least, bookended by my sister in Jesus, <laughs> Shelly Quinn. So glad you're here, sis. Oh, it's so exciting to be here. Thursday's lesson is the world of the Psalms. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Brian, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we now dive into a new adventurous study through the book of Psalms, Lord, we ask that your leadership be with us, your spirit be poured out upon us, mm -hmm. and that all the words uh, that we say, everything that's communicated here that goes out, Lord, will bless us and bless so many other people, and that each and every one of us will be drawn to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. from this incredible study. So we give this time to you, and we ask that your will be done in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 The Psalms explores the gamut of human emotion, especially as it relates to God. The Psalms address joy and sadness, fear and frustration, repentance and forgiveness, peace and anxiety, depression and praise. Everything comes back to praise. We see that over and over again throughout the book of Psalms. It was the hymnal, you could say, for ancient Israel's worship. Mm -hmm. it can be spoken or sung in private or in corporate worship. In fact, as we journey through the study, we'll discover that there's musical annotations throughout the Psalms suggest they were mostly written to be sung in the context of worship. What I love about the Psalms, it explores the attributes of our God. He is king and judge. He's creator and sustainer. He's redeemer and savior. He's our healer and our refuge and our shepherd. He is great and powerful and eternal and holy. He is omnipresent everywhere at once. He is omnipotent, all powerful. He is righteous and just and faithful and forgiving. He is patient and merciful and compassionate and loving. Our God is good. Mm -hmm. Here's a quote from the lesson. It says, the Psalms have served as the prayer book and hymn book to generations of believers. It's a collection of 150 Psalms. It's interesting, both the Hebrew and the Septuagint contain 150 Psalms, but they number them slightly differently. And most English translations will follow the Hebrew numbering of the Psalms. There's two ways that you can divide the Psalms. As we study throughout this quarter, the author of the lesson, let me mention her name. I'm not gonna pronounce it right. Dragoslava Sontrick. She's a PhD in Old Testament. She's the managing editor of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at the General Conference. And she did a great job with this lesson. She arranges our lessons thematically. And we'll be looking at that, all the different types of Psalms. We have individual and corporate laments or prayers or cries for help. There's individual and corporate thanksgiving, the thanksgiving or praise psalms.
We look at hymns honoring God as our creator, hymns honoring God as our king. We look at songs of trust and songs of Zion, royal psalms and pilgrim psalms and wisdom psalms and Torah psalms, penitential psalms, which would be seeking forgiveness of God. It runs the whole gamut, and we're going to explore and study that this quarter. Another way to divide the Psalms, the author of the quarterly does not do it, but you can divide them into five books which mirror the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament. For instance, Psalms 1 to 41 would parallel with Genesis. Psalms 42 to 72 would parallel with Exodus. And you can go down and see book three of the Psalms would parallel with Leviticus, book four with Numbers, and book five with Deuteronomy. To me, it's fascinating when we study. There are so many ways mm -hmm. that you can study the Word of God that you can open up and see that. This week, we look at how to read the Psalms. And let's read our memory text. We are in Luke 24 verses 44 and 45. This is, of course, Jesus speaking to the disciples mm -hmm. in the upper room after the walk to Emmaus with the disciples. Then he appears in the upper room and he says these words, Luke 24, 44 and 45. Then he said to them, these are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms mm -hmm. concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Now, there were three main sections of the Hebrew scriptures. We have the law, the prophets, and the writings. And of the writings, the most important or talked about or pivotal work would be the Psalms. So you can see Jesus references that here. He says the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. This week, we just look at... What's the inspiration of the Psalms? And what's the purpose of the Psalms in worship? Who are the authors of the Psalms? And what are the types of Psalms? The poetry of the Psalms, the emotion of the Psalms, the prayers of the Psalms, and most importantly, the God-centeredness of the Psalms. On Sunday, in my remaining time, we're going to look at the Psalms in ancient Israel's worship. And I want to submit to you seven purposes, if we get through them all, Ryan, all right. of the Psalms in worship. For number one, we're going to 1 Chronicles. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going to verse 7. It starts out on that day. What day? What is happening here? The ark has just been brought to Jerusalem and placed in the midst of the tabernacle. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. We see here David is the author of this psalm, and actually they quote later from Psalm 105, and you can read it in Psalm. It's quoted in 1 Chronicles 16, but it's also Psalm 105. David delivered the psalm into the hand of Asaph. Who is Asaph? He's one of the three leaders of the temple singers. He's a singer in Israel, Ryan. That's right. That we see the psalms connected with worship. We see music connected with worship and music connected with the psalms. If you jump down to verse 37 after the psalm is quoted, it says, He, that means David, left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly as every day's work required. So what does that mean? They were charged with music in the temple worship, and it was a mm -hmm. daily experience. Takeaway number one, music is an integral part of worship. Yes. Make the Psalms a part of your daily worship. In fact, Psalm 105, which is the Psalm that David delivered there in 1 Chronicles 16, Psalm 105, 2 says, sing to him, sing praises to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Music is an integral part of worship. Mm -hmm. Now for number two, we go to Nehemiah 12, verse 8. It says, moreover, the Levites were, and it lists their names. I'm not going to read them because I can't pronounce them. But what do the Levites do? They led the Thanksgiving Psalms, he and his brethren. Now, it's interesting to me. We think of the restoration of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of the temple, 
Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, but they also restored worship. Mm -hmm. We see the restoration of worship. Takeaway number two, thanksgiving is an integral part of worship because what did the Levites lead? They led them in thanksgiving psalms as part of their worship. Make thankfulness part of your worship. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure what you can even be thankful for, you can pray the Psalms back to God. You can find one of those Thanksgiving Psalms and you can pray it, sing it mm -hmm. back to God. Number three, for this we're going to Psalm 18 verse one. Psalm 18, one, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. We see David, the author of this psalm. It's the same psalm mentioned in 2 Samuel 22. And it talks about how David sang this psalm when God delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from Saul. Mm. Takeaway number three, acknowledging God as our sovereign and expressing love to him is an integral part of worship. What did David say? I will love you, O Lord. I think sometimes in our worship, we're afraid to make emotion part of worship, mm. but we can acknowledge God is supreme and we can express love to him. And that is part of worship. Number four, we're in Psalm 30 verse one. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up, have not let my foes reign over me. We see a similar concept in Psalm 145, verses one to three. I will extol you, O Lord, my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Takeaway number four. Praise is an integral part of worship. Yeah. Now you might say, wait a minute, Jelly, number two was Thanksgiving is a part of worship. I believe that Thanksgiving is thanking God for what he's done for us. Praise is expressing who he is. Mm -hmm. It's thanking him, you could say that, but for who he is, not for what he's done for us, but for who he is and his greatness and his majesty and his holiness and his goodness and his love. Moving quickly. The next one, number five, Psalm 86, verse one. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Takeaway number five, acknowledgement of our need is an integral mm -hmm. part of worship. Mm -hmm. That probably should have been number one because when we come into God's presence, the first thing is to recognize who we are mm -hmm. and who God is and that we are poor and sinful and needy and we need him. Number six is Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Take away six. Music is connected with the word in worship. Did you notice that in that scripture? Mm -hmm. The word of God is connected with music. So not just as music part of worship, but music in scripture. Sing scripture songs back to God Amen. as part of your worship. And number seven, mm -hmm. prayer is connected with the Psalms in worship. Spend time praying the Psalms back to God and it will change and revolutionize your worship. Amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Great opener. My name is Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled Meet the Psalmist. And uh, we're going to kind of continue on the theme, a little bit of the same theme that uh, Jill brought out, but we're going to go a little deeper uh, into some other Psalms and look at just the different elements of what we see and how we see these Psalmists opening up their hearts and sharing with us what they're going through at that particular time. I want to start by what the lesson begins with. It says King David, whose name appears in the titles of most Psalms, was active in organizing the liturgy of Israel's worship. He is called the sweet psalmist of Israel there in 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 1. The New Testament attests to Davidic authorship of various psalms. Uh, and of course, the scripture brings out in Matthew 22 and Acts chapter 2, uh, chapter 34, 35, Acts 4, Romans 4, 6. We find uh, reference to this, uh, this truth. Uh, numerous psalms were composed by the temple musicians, as Jill brought out, who were also Levites. For example, Psalm 50 and of course, uh, 
the, 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 the lesson does show here Psalm 73 to 83 by Asaph. But if you do a little bit deeper research, you'll find that many of these uh, psalms were actually written by David before the purpose of putting them to music, which of course uh, the Bible does attest that if it says a psalm of Asaph, many times it was written by David for Asaph to set to music. For instance, Psalm 73 would be a great example. But then you go on and read uh, Psalm 42, Psalm 44 to 47, Psalm 49, for, uh, Psalm 84, 85, and Psalm uh, 88 by the sons of Korah, as the lesson brings out here, Psalms 88 by uh, Haman or Haman, however you say that, uh, the Ezraite. And Psalm 89 by Ethan the Ezraite. And of course, beyond them, Solomon, of course, is, is responsible for writing Psalm 72, Psalm 127. And of course, Moses is uh, traditionally attested to have written Psalm chapter 90 as well, or Psalm, or Psalm 90 as well. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into some of these songs and we're gonna, Psalms and we're going to see uh, just what the Psalms reveal about the experiences of these authors. And I love uh, the book of Psalms. I've read the book of Psalms over and over and over throughout my life because it just brings uh, it really shows you that these were real men. These were real men going through real things, pouring out their heart to God in ways that we can relate to. And that's the that's wonderful right. thing about it. Uh, for instance, you have a psalm of dependence there in Psalm 25, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 25, verses 1 through 5. Notice what it says here. It says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, I trust in you. Uh, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. You'll see this come up quite a bit. Uh, David, especially writing and saying, Lord, help me overcome my enemies. This way, David was a man of war. David was a, a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart, and the enemy threw everything he could at him. So you'll see this theme often rise up over and over. Uh, verse 3 of Psalm 25 says, Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause show me your ways O Lord teach me your paths lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation on you I wait all the day so you can see David's dependence here just Lord Lord I'm depending on you I'm waiting on you O Lord of course there are other Psalms we'll see deep soul searching and spiritual examination that's brought about through the Psalms confession and repentance and of course, psalms of thanks and praise. For instance, in Psalm 75 and verse 1 here, uh, and also Psalm 77 and verse 1, it says, We thank, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. That's Psalm 75 and verse 1. And of course, also Psalm 71, 77 verse 1, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, he gave, and he gave ear to me. So again, understanding that God hears us, God's listening to us, mm. and they understood this. There are psalms of lamenting that we see. Psalms and lamenting, of course, there's many of these, but the example given here in the, uh, in the, in the uh, study is Psalm 88, verses 1 through 3. Psalms 88, verses 1 through 3 says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out, uh, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. And so we can relate to this. Have you ever felt those times where you're just like, Lord, please hear my prayer. I need you to come through like you've never come through before. We sense the humanity of these authors as they often are crying out and lamenting. And of course, as Joe brought out, there were psalms uh, that were meant for to be sing as songs or of course with singing. For instance, Psalm 89 and verse 1 makes it clear, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with mm -hmm. my mouth. I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. And so we see much and much of this. And of course, songs of, psalms of longing. Uh, and, and of course, the one that when it comes to my mind that I love even singing often a song is based on. And it's the song As the Deer, which is based on Psalm chapter 42 and verse 1. And I love the words to it. As the deer panteth for the water, so my so longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee. I just love that even though it's based off of that one text there in Psalm uh, 42 and verse 1, it just really shows the author's longing desire. Lord, I need you. I depend on you. I long and, and yearn for you each and every day. Psalm 84 verses 1 until you get that same tone, this deep longing, this yearning for the Lord. How lovely is your tabernacle, the psalmist writes. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs Yes, even faints 
for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Have you ever experienced that? Mm -hmm. I know I find that often happening. The older I get, the more experienced I get, the more stuff you go through. You just learn just how ignorant you really are about life. You learn, the more you learn, the more you realize just how much little you really know and how dependent and longing you are for the Lord to show up to lead and to guide you. Because ultimately, I don't trust myself, right? The more you grow in God, you realize, I don't trust me, Lord, I trust you. Take the will of my life. You see these messages, you see this, this powerful, uh, 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 just, sh- just foreshadowing and, and beautiful, amazing messages just burst forth from the psalmist mm-hmm. as, you br- as you go through and scale over these psalms. Of course, um, it also shows us the psalmists are but a reflection of the example of the many uh, people in the Bible that you know, went through some messed up situations and weren't perfect, right? These were men who were striving for that perfection in Christ. They were striving for to grow in character and 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 uh, and uh, to be more like Jesus. But yet they were they went through some messed up stuff. And I just made a notes some notes here. I, I'm probably not going to read all of these, but it's a reflection of these psalmists are a reflection of the other Bible writers and characters that we find throughout the Bible. For instance, Abraham being too old, Elijah was fearful and suicidal, Joseph was arrogant and abusive. Used and Job went bankrupt. Moses was a murderer and had a speech problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a woman. Isaac Rahab was a prostitute. You go through all of these different people, but yet you see that these psalmists were also men that needed the Lord. They also had went through some messed up situations and they certainly needed the Lord to come through for them as well, even in their weaknesses and in their trials and in their tribulations. And so uh, I just love that. And of course, I, I wanted to end this particular lesson on one of my favorite psalms because the many psalmists help remind us of our brokenness and constant need to the Savior. That's ultimately what I get from this. So much more than just that one sentence that I just said. But when I scale through and I read and survey the psalms, it helps me to be reminded of my constant need. And you know what? I'm broken. I need fixed. I need Christ to be that potter as I am the clay to mend me, to break me, to mold me, to shape me into the character and into the man he wants me to be. Mm -hmm. And I love Psalm 23. And I'm sure we're going to spend some time Mm -hmm. in that psalm at some point in the future. But I just love the words here. The Lord is my shepherd. David pouring his heart out, his need, his dependence upon God. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I love that. He says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God has not given us the spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. He says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Mm -hmm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You, You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. God brings abundance of blessings, even though we don't deserve it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And I love how it ends forever. Uh, The psalmist reminds us, each and every one of us, uh, each and every one of them reminds us that quitting is not an option. Even though though these brothers went through stuff, even though there were moments when it seems like they were at their wits end and you can just sense the lament, you can just sense the pain and the sorrow that they're dealing for, even in times when yes, they were literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death, they remind us I will, through it all, trust in you, Lord. I will, through Through it all, dwell in the house of the Lord, not just today and quit tomorrow, not Mm -hmm. for a week and then quit the next week, not for a few years and then give it all up a few years down the road, but I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because Mm -hmm. quitting is not an option. And so the psalmists remind us, these beautiful, beautiful psalms remind us that putting our hand in the hand of the Lord and allowing him to lead and steer our life through whatever trials, difficulties, tribulations, through the good and through the bad, we trust in the Lord because he knows what's best for us. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What an incredible study. How encouraging. This study is going to be great. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeping along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. 
just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to our study on how to read the Psalms. We're going to pass it over to Tuesday and Pastor James Rafferty. Thank you, Jill. We are in Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled A Song for Every Season. I'm Pastor James Rafferty. And as Jill mentioned, the Psalms are not only the hymnal of the Old Testament, but Christian believers in Pakistan use it as such today. They will sing through the Psalms. In fact, when I was over there giving meetings some years ago, they would spend two or three hours singing the Psalms, and then they give you about maybe 20 minutes for our sermon. So the Psalms are <laughs> powerful because they really do, as, as Ryan was saying, they really do encourage us mm -hmm. to remain faithful to God who is the one who is faithful to us. The quarterly, the text brings out here in the Sabbath School lesson, that the Psalms make the believing community aware of the full range of human experience. They demonstrate that believers can worship God in every season in life. In them we see the following Number one, hymns that magnify God for His majesty and power in creation, His kingly rule, His judgment, His faithfulness. For example, Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6, The earth is the Lord's, yes. and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For He has founded upon the seas, He established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in His holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. And we'll talk about Selah here in just a second. Number two, Thanksgiving Psalms. The Psalms express profound gratitude for God's abundant blessings. Read Psalm 107, for example, beginning with verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, Psalm 107, verse 2, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. How about verse 8? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men, for He satisfies the longing soul, verse 9, and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Or how about verse 15? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men, for He's broken the gates of brass and He's cut the bars of iron in sunder. Or how about verse 21? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Do you see some repetition here? And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare His works with rejoicing. Thanksgiving to God is a sacrifice that He delights to hear. Or how about verse 31? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt Him also in the congregation of the people mm -hmm. and praise Him in the assembly of the elders. Or about number three, laments or heartfelt cries to God for deliverance in trouble. This is another characteristic of the psalm, Psalm 3, 3 and 4. But thou, O Lord, o Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. Or there's wisdom psalms, psalms that provide practical guidelines for righteous living, like Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Or Psalm 32, one of my favorite promises, verse 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as a horse or as a mule that has no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Or Psalm 33, verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the heathen to naught. Mm. He makes the devices of the people of none effect. And then there's royal psalms, royal psalms that point to Christ, who is sovereign and deliverer of God's people. Psalms that read like Psalm 116 verses 1 through 6, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death come past me, the pains of hell get hold of me, I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul 
soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Or there's historical Psalms, Psalms that recall Israel pa Israel's past and, and highlight faithfulness and, and Israel's unfaithfulness to teach coming generations not to repeat the mistakes of their ancestors, but to put their trust in God and to remain faithful to our covenant God, like Psalms 105 and 106. Remember His marvelous works, works that He has done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. O ye seed of Abraham and His servants, ye children of Jacob and His chosen. We're not going to read all of those Psalms, but we are encouraged to read Psalm 105 5 and 106 once every week, just to remember God's leading in past history of God's people, because as we remember how God has led in the past, we will have nothing to fear for the future. Mm. And then, and this is just an additional one that I threw in there, there's angry Psalms. Mm. There's Psalms that show us how to process our anger with God, right? If you ever read the Psalms and wondered, why is David so angry some of the time, right? Well, he's processing. He's processing that anger. It's, it's good to process our anger with God. When we learn how to process our anger with God, we learn how to process anger responsibly so that hopefully we won't process a anger irresponsibly. Psalm 54, help me, save me, O God, by thy name. Judge me by thy strength. That's the first thing uh, that David does in these angry Psalms is he asks God to help him. And he, mm -hmm. and he says, hear my prayer verse to, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. And then he explains his situation. For strangers, verse 3, have risen up against me and oppressive seek my soul. They have not set God before them. And uh, behold God, verse 4, God is my helper. The Lord is with me. Uh, with them that uphold my soul. And then he lets go, he lets it out, he lets his anger out. Verse five, he shall reward evil unto my enemies, cut them off in thy truth. Just, just let them have it. Of course, David actually doesn't do that specifically with Saul because he lets his anger out to God and God uh, fills the void of that anger being released that he fills the void with his spirit, with the Holy Spirit. And that's what God wants to do for each one of us. And when he does that, then David in Psalm 54 verse six, we praise God. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. David was just angry and now he's praising God because he's let all of that anger out and God has filled the void with his spirit. Verse seven, for he has delivered me out of all my trouble. Mine eye, mine eye has seen his deliverance upon my enemies. And of course, this is a faith statement that David makes. Now the poetry of the Psalms demonstrates distinctive power to capture the attentions of the readers. And some of these poetic devices are kind of lost in translation, uh, the quarterly says, but we can still see in uh, our native language uh, and appreciate many of them. For example, Parallelism involves the combining of symmetrically constructed words or phrases or thoughts. Parallelism helps in understanding the meaning of the corresponding parts. For instance, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. In this parallelism, my soul and all that in within me, na namely one's whole being, are the same thing. Or again, Psalm 147, verse 11, the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him, comma, those that hope in his mercy. So those that fear him is parallel to those that hope in his mercy. To fear God is to hope in his mercy. Uh, imagery, for example, the use of figurative language to strongly appeal to the reader's physical senses. God is our refuge and strength, and he's depicted as the shadow uh, of wings. He's, a sh he's got his shadow of wings over us, Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I would say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Or merism, which expresses the totality of a pair of contrasting parts. I have cried unto the Lord day and night. Those are contrasting parts, day and night, but that's the totality of the thought. I've cried unto the Lord day and night. And then we have word plays, which employ the sound of words to make a pun or highlight a spiritual message. Like in Psalm 96, four and five, the Hebrew word Elohim, gods, and Elihim, idols, creates a word play to convey the message that the gods of the nations only appear to be Elohim, gods, but merely are Elohim. Elohim, Elihim, idols. And then this contrasting opposite thoughts in the second line. For example, Psalm 1, verse 6, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So you've got the righteous and the ungodly contrasted. And then this synthetic poetry, thought completed in the second line, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which is driven away by the wind. So you've got the second thought repeated, excuse me, the, the, uh, the thought completed in the second line. And finally, you have the word Selah. Selah denotes a brief interlude 
either a call for pause or reflection, or is it Selah? Selah. Either a cause for pause or for reflection on the messenger or a particular section of the psalm, uh, a change maybe of musical accompaniment. Selah, think about this. And so many times when you go through the psalms, David makes a point, a profound point, maybe right in the middle of the psalm, and you've got this Selah, and, and that's calling us to just think about or pause yeah. upon that. And we use that same phrase many times, right. not Selah, but the same idea many right. times as we talk Think about that for a second, you know, think about that, right? And so the Psalms complete this dynamic, uh, uh, powerful, beautiful communication that God is encouraging us to enter into when we communicate with each other, when we communicate with God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor James. Inspiring. Praise the Lord. Well, we are now on Wednesday's portion, and my name is John Dinsey. The title for Wednesday is Inspired prayers. As you read the Psalms, you will notice that there are many prayers and you see that David is just pouring out his heart to God, talking to God, letting him know what's inside his heart. And the lesson points out to see a few of these. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 and 2. And we have there, now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So you see here that even in the act of prayer, the Holy Spirit gets involved mm. and uh, the expressions that you see in the Psalms that are prayers are also directed by the Holy Spirit. You know, when you approach God, you're coming to Him and you have a situation, you have something going on, uh, the Holy Spirit takes over even in your prayer expression to God. And this is a marvelous thing to understand. Uh, I'm going to uh, mention a few places where you see that uh, the Holy Spirit is involved. Uh, here in the book of Acts, you see Peter confirm that the Holy Spirit spoke through David. Psalms 115, uh, so, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. And he says, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Acts 1.20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishop prick let another take. So you see uh, Peter confirming that the Holy Spirit spoke by his servant David. Now I want to take you to uh, Romans chapter 8. And the lesson points out verse 26 and 27, but I want to start in verse 21 to present the context and how this is presented here in a way that leads you to understand how the Holy Spirit gets involved. Uh, verse 21, Romans 8, 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, notice, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. We are supposed to notice this. And uh, this is being brought up by Paul. Now, it says, verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now notice verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groaning, mm. with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Can you wrap your mind around that to understand that as you go to the Lord in prayer and you humble yourself before Him, the Holy Spirit gets involved yeah. and takes your prayers 
to heaven with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is a marvelous thing to understand, and it should draw us close to the Lord to understand that the Holy Spirit is even taking our prayers and putting them in the language of heaven. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. Uh, now, uh, I want to let you know, and you should know, that the Holy Spirit gets more involved in our lives than we think. Hmm. I remember a time that we received a phone call here at 3ABN because uh, I was working in pastoral ministries and people are calling with different problems, difficulties they're facing. And uh, you know, we're praying before the people call in for prayer for the Holy Spirit to use us. And this is one time when this man presents this situation. He says, I am going to court tomorrow. People have uh, come against me unfairly. They're, they are accusing me of something I have not done. And as he was talking, I thought, I'll share with him Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, mm -hmm. present help in time of trouble. That's right. And I continued listening to him. And just when I thought the time had come to share Psalm 46, Psalm 46 completely left my mind. I could not even remember it. Mm. I said, I'm trying to remember this, the scripture that I wanted to share with you, and it was gone. It was gone. Mm. And then, well, uh, let's go to Psalm, and I mentioned a Psalm, and I said, well, I don't know why that Psalm is coming to my mind. Mm. I don't even know what it says. Let's go look at it. <laughs> so we went to that Psalm, and I was amazed the Holy Spirit wow. had the words in the psalm that specifically addressed the situation he was going through. Mm. Look at God. And I said, praise the Lord. Look, this is the Holy Spirit led in this, I told this person, and this is what I believe you need. Yes, you're right, he says. And then it was after that that Psalm 46 came to mm. mind. And I said, well, this is the psalm that I originally wanted to talk to you, but the Holy Spirit wanted to share this with you. So we need to, get, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit gets involved mm -hmm. in our lives and in our prayers. Psalm 46, um, Psalm 6, verse 9. Notice uh, here the expression, uh, David saying that, this is a prayer, the Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer, and the Lord will receive your prayer. Psalm 17, 1. Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer. Psalm 39, 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord and give ear unto my cry. Uh, Psalm 54, verse 2, Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. Listen to me, Lord. David is pouring out his heart. Psalm 55, verse 1, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. You see over and over again, many Psalms are really prayers. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I want to encourage you to do. You don't know what you should pray for. You know, the Holy Spirit does. We don't even know what we should pray for as, we, as we, we should. So if you don't know what to say in your prayers, I encourage you to look into the Psalms, begin to write them down and see how David is expressing himself. And you may say, well, I identify with that. I think I'll pray that. Hmm. And you can pray this back to the Lord, just as David was doing, but apply it to your situation, your uh, experience. From the lesson, we have these words. The psalmist addressed God personally, personally as my God, mm -hmm. O Lord, and my King. Psalm 5, 2, Psalm 84, 3 are examples. The psalmists often implore God to give ear. Psalm 5, 1 is an example. Hear my prayer, Psalm 39, 12. Also, they say, look, Lord, look at my situation. Look at what I'm going through. Psalm 25, 18. And then, of course, there is the answer me, Lord, answer me, Psalm 102, verse 2, and deliver me, Psalm 6, 4. And the lesson says, these are clearly the expressions of someone praying to God. Who does not want their prayers to be answered when they go before the Lord? This is your, your, your desire. You eagerly want to see the Lord work out a miracle in your life. The lesson brings out that Jesus, too, quoted from the Psalms, such as in Luke chapter 20, verse 42 and 43. And it says, when he quoted directly from Psalms 110, verse 1. I look now at Luke 20, verse 42 and 43. This is Jesus speaking. He says, now David himself said in the book of Psalms, mm -hmm. the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Mm -hmm. So you see, this is a, uh, a, a, a quoting of Psalm 110, verse 1. You can look that up at another time. 
But uh, you will notice also that the Psalms also express the feelings of Jesus, uh, such as Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, mm -hmm. my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? And it, it is as if uh, David was given a preview of what Jesus was going to go through. And it's, the, it's that these uh, can be said that it was not David saying these things. It was mm -hmm. Jesus through the Holy Spirit impressing David to write these things. Remember, mm -hmm. these things I have said unto you that when they come to pass, you may believe. So as Jesus said these things, they remembered, hey, this is written in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Psalm 69. Verse 89, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my brother, my mother's children, for the zeal of their house hath eaten me up and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Notice also here, Psalm 69, 21, they gave me also gall for my meat and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus identifies himself in the Psalms as well. Thank you all, each and every one. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday's lesson. We are looking at the who, the what, the why, the where, the how. I've got the where. Thursday's lesson is the world of the Psalms. We're going to look into the purpose of these Psalms and the world they lived in at the time. What place does God occupy in the psalmist's life? And then I'm going to ask you, we need to check our own pulse and see what place does God occupy in our lives? Let's look at six examples that will show us God is the center of the psalmist's life. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Mm -hmm. And the result, because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Mm -hmm. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Do you see him as that? Mm. Psalm 57, 2, I love this. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him, not just occasionally, not just in the morning, trust in him at all times, you people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Do you pour your heart out to God? Is he the center of your life? Psalm 121, 7. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul when you're living in the secret place of the Most High God, when He's the center of your life. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. Now, here's one of my favorites. Psalm 138, 8. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love this. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that's God's plan. God will perfect that which concerns you. And he just then breaks out and prays, your mercy, O Lord, your has said, your loving kindness, your covenant faithfulness, O Lord, endures forever. So the interesting thing here, when we look to the Psalms, the psalmist all realize God hears them no matter where they might be. And he responds in his perfect time. He is the ever-present, never-failing God. Here's what the quarterly says. The world of the Psalms is wholly God-centered. It seeks to submit in prayer and praise all life experiences to God. God is the sovereign creator, the king and the judge of all the earth. He provides 
all things for his children. Therefore, he's to be trusted at all times because God was the center of the psalmist life and the people's life back then. Guess what? Worship was central to their lives. If God is the center of our lives, worship should be central to our lives. Let me give you seven quick examples there. Psalm 44, verse 8. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Psalm 47, 1 and 7. Something I'm doing a lot lately without realizing it. Clap your hands, mm -hmm. all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph, for God is the king of the earth. Sing praises to him with understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, centrality of God in their lives produces the centrality of worship. And worship in the biblical culture, it was natural. It was the, the temple was the undisputed center mm -hmm. of the entire community's life. Oh, that church were that to us today, mm. yeah. right? Psalm 3, verse 4. The psalmist cries out because he knows everything that happens, both good and bad, should be expressed in worship. And he cries out, Psalm 3, verse 4. I cried to the Lord with my voice. He heard me from his holy hill. Selah. Think about that. God is the God who hears you. He is the God who answers your prayer. He takes action. Psalm 18, 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Psalm 20 and verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy hill with the saving strength of his hand. Psalm 24 verses 7 through 10. Woohoo! I love this one. Lift up your hands. Heads, O oh, you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates. He would say to us today, open your heart. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come into you. Who is this Lord of glory, King of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8. These are special. These are showing the omnipresence of the Lord. Psalm 139, verse 7 and 8. David writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee? Flee from your presence. You can't get away from God. Mm. He knows everything that's going on in your life. And you know, you can't hide it. Some people are like, oh, I don't want to say this to the Lord in prayer. If you're upset, he knows you're upset. If you're thinking something bad, he knows what you're saying. You may as well talk about it to him in prayer. But he says, if I... He said, if I ascend into the heaven, you're there. Mm -hmm. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. This reminds me when God had Moses write Genesis, the Lord didn't start off. The Lord obviously didn't find it necessary to explain his existence. Mm -hmm. He just had Moses write two different narratives of the creation story. We find in Genesis 1 a picture of God who transcends everything. He's high and lifted up. He's, he's before, there, there was never a beginning, never an end. And we can't comprehend that in our human, in our humanity because everything we know has a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. 
And we can only be in one place at one time. So it's like, oh Lord, how can you be everywhere? But you know what he does in the second narrative? God has, this is repeat and enlarge right from the beginning of the Bible. God has Moses write the second narrative and all of a sudden in the second story of creation, it shows his eminence, that he is an up close and personal God, Amen. a God who speaks, a God who hears, a God who is present everywhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, Sheol, the grave, behold, you are there. The Psalms speak to making God the center of your life and making worship sinful to your life. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Amen. No, no, no. Thank you so much, Shelley, Pastor Johnny, Pastor James and Ryan. What an incredible study as we do this overview of the book of Psalms. Before we jump in, I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. Yeah, man, I just wanted to go to Psalm 23, verse 6 again, the kind of the theme text that I ended on. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And just remember the Psalms cover a full range of human experience. Whatever you're going through in life, whatever struggles you're going through, if you're in a, in a time of praise and thanksgiving, you'll find that experience in the Psalms. Amen. Amen. The Psalms are inspired scriptures that we should pay attention to. They are prayers as well, and we encourage you to study and sing them and study them. Amen. I know that I learned, I, I learned to praise. I always start with thanksgiving and praise. And I was so limited, but I go through the Psalms and find the praise in the Psalms. They're so beautiful. Let me ask you, where are you seeking to keep God at a distance in your life? Mm -hmm. What aspect of your life are you trying to keep from Him? He knows it all. Read the Psalms, share your heart with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. What an incredible study. We are just getting started. I think from a personal perspective, what I really like about the Psalms is that no matter where you are in your journey with Jesus, no matter what I'm feeling on a certain day, I can open up the Psalms and I can be honest with God. Mm -hmm. You can pray those Psalms back to Him. If you're struggling with discouragement, if you're dealing with anger, as Pastor James brought up, if you're dealing with self-pity or you need God to bring some vengeance, or maybe you want to express the praise and thanksgiving of your heart, all of that is in the Psalms. All of that you can share with God and be honest with Him. Next lesson, lesson number two, join us, teach us to pray. Join us as we explore how we can take these Psalms and pray them back to God.